YG, my name is uh, Stan Ludet, Grand Chief of uh, Meshkegua Council. I'm here to, uh, to talk about the, the treaty, how it came about, what happened back in the day, what was the intention of the government, of the Crown, how did we understand it, and uh, basically how it was described or not described to us. And the, uh, the title of my presentation is The Real Agreement as Orally Agreed to. And you'll see uh, partway through my presentation why we call it the real agreement as orally agreed to. Uh, James Bay Treaty or Treaty Number no. 9 is one of 11 treaties across the country of Canada. Uh, treaties 1 to 11 cover, cover I would say, about 90% of, uh, of, uh, of Canada. Uh, as well, there are a number of uh, modern day treaties or other treaties that are not necessarily classified uh, as, as part of the number trees. For example, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement in Quebec with the Crees of, of Quebec, our neighbors in, uh, on, on that side of the bay, uh, they have uh, that agreement with, uh, with Quebec and Canada. So that's a modern day treaty. And there are a number of other uh, modern day treaties uh, in, in British Columbia with the sea, uh, sea Shelt and, uh, and, uh, and a couple of other First Nations and regions in, in uh, in, uh, in British Columbia. So the treaties are, are uh, very, very important and you'll see why over the course of this presentation. The James Bay Treaty was signed in 1905-1906 and again with additions in 1929 and 1930. And when we talk about the treaty, the treaty is something that's, uh, that's recognized by the, uh, by, by the Crown and, and the Government of Canada. Uh, the Canadian um, government has a constitution and basically what that constitution is, it's a supreme law of Canada. It's how, how Canada functions as a nation. And, and part of that constitution of Canada includes a provision, section 35 of the Canadian constitution, that recognizes Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal people in Canada. So treaty number nine, the James Bay Treaty, is recognized in the Canadian Constitution, Section 35, as being uh, uh, providing for constitutional protection of Aboriginal treaty rights. So that's very, very important to know. And the James Bay Treaty, Treaty Number no. 9, involves obviously Canada. And for the first time in treaties that were made back, uh, back in the early 1900s and uh, 1800s, a province was part of that treaty. And you'll, uh, I'll explain later why and how the province became involved in the treaty making process. And when we talk about a treaty, we have, to, we have to do so in the context of our elders, your grandparents, your great grandparents, my great uh, grandparents. My grandfather was actually a signator to Treaty Number no. 9 in old Fort Albany. And we do the treaty discussions in memory of them. Uh, because they're the ones who carried that torch, they're the ones who advocated, they're the ones who had that discussion, and we need to uh, recognize and honor them as we talk about the, the, the treaty. And not only that, but it's also for our future generations, our, our children and grandchildren yet to be uh, unborn. And, uh, and we, we do that so that they, they can learn and they can uh, understand our history as well. When we talk about a treaty, we have to understand, <clears throat> let's define what a treaty is first. So if, if, you, if you go back and look in a dictionary or, or look in your computer and Google the definition of treaty, we'll find that the definition of treaty is very simple. That it's a formal agreement between two or more nations. A formal agreement between two or more nations. That's a treaty. It's got to be nations. And, and for example, two cities can't enter into a treaty. The town of Moussini and, uh, and uh, somebody else can't enter into a treaty. It's got to be nations that enter into treaties. So, it's, uh, so that's what the treaty definition is. So let's, take about, uh, let's look at nations. What is a nation? We find when we Google and as well look in a dictionary perhaps, that the, the nation is a large group of people sharing the same culture, language, history, and inhabiting a particular state or area. A group of people sharing the same culture, language, history, 
I'm sharing the same area or land. That's a nation. So when we think about where we are today in terms of the Moose Cree First Nation or Moose Factory, the Moose Cree First Nation, and when we look at that definition, a large group of people sharing the same culture, Moose Cree people have the same culture, we have the same language, we have a history, and we inhabit a certain area. So could we say then that the Moose Cree First Nation is a nation as defined in, 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 in law and internationally? Yes. Moose Cree First Nation is a nation, as is Kasachuan, as is Fort Albany, as is um, Arawapiskal, Chapel Cree, Missinabi, Newpost, Tequatago. And when we look at the whole area of Meshkeguac territory, Meshkeguac being Cree people, when we look at the whole area of Meshkeguac territory, and we see the Cree area and all the areas that we encompass, we're a group of people who, who have the same culture. Crees are the same culture. We have the same language, different dialects perhaps, but the same language. We have the same history, and we inhabit a huge area right up from Hudson Bay right down to the bottom of James Bay and inland. So could we say <clears throat> that the Meshkegwak people, the Crees, is a nation of people? Yes, of course. So a definition of a treaty again, an agreement between nations, and what's a nation? It's a group of people sharing very particular uh, key areas in terms of language, uh, culture, and land. So that's what the treaty is, that's what the definition uh, of, of the nationhood is. And that's why it's very important, very, very important that, to say that we're unique and in a sense that we have a very, very special status here in terms of our nationhood, in terms of treaty with, with Canada. And to further define those, you can, you can Google any kinds of laws and court cases over the, over the over the, the past number of years that, uh, that, uh, that show the, uh, the oral significance of treaty is as relevant as the written part. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later, the, the oral part of, of treaties, because that's what our elders talk about when they talk about the treaty. They talk about it in the sense of what they heard from their grandparents, what they heard from their great-grandparents, and it's been carried on to us today. So, so you're going to be hearing a lot about the, uh, the oral portion, portion of it. Now the treaty making process. How did that happen? How did the treaty making process happen? Well, back in the day they didn't have any airplanes, of course, and they traveled down by canoes and, and uh, paddled by canoes down these major uh, 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 riverways and, uh, and went to these certain places where our people were gathered. They had their treaty document already prepared. The treaty document was prepared by their lawyers, by their policy people back in the, before 1905, 1903, 1904, they're, they're preparing the treaty document already. So they had it with them, already prepared, ready for signature. And the treaty document had no translation, no translation whatsoever to show to our, our, our forefathers what it exact, exactly meant. They didn't leave the treaty document with us for us to comprehend, for us to review, for us to think about. None of that happened. And they did not read the treaty document word for word when they came, came to see us. And they didn't stay very long. They only averaged maybe half a day overnight, then they're on their way, on their way to, to, the, to the next place. So it's very, very quick. The treaty document prepared already, did not explain it uh, very clearly, did not uh, explain it word per word. And they, they used words that our people would, uh, would accept to, to entice our people to be able to accept it and put our, our signature or mark on it. And I'll explain that a little bit later as well. And who are the treaty commissioners? Who was the treaty party? Well, there are three commissioners appointed by Canada and Ontario, two by Canada, James Stewart and Duncan Campbell Scott. Those were the two uh, commissioners appointed by Canada to, to come and see us and our, and, our, and our forefathers to talk about the treaty. And like I said, for the first time, Ontario uh, was part of the treaty process, and they had their own uh, commissioner appointed by them as well. His name was uh, Daniel George McMartin. And as well, they had some security with them to, uh, to assist them. They had some medical people with them to look after the treaty party and provide medical services to our people wherever they went. And, uh, and they, had, uh, they used the services of Hudson Bay uh, staff or workers to be able to uh, uh, translate uh, the best they could in, in, in the areas where they went. 
So that, that's how the treaty party came about, and that's who the treaty was. So the, in 1905, the, uh, the treaty party uh, started their, their treaty uh, making process at the Osnaburg, or Mishkikogam, as we uh, call it today. And they went all the way down to what's now known as Fort Hope, Martin Falls, uh, Fort Albany, not Fort Albany, the one that we know today. Uh, it's Old Post, it's, um, it's, uh, it's the original uh, uh, Albany site um, where a lot of our grandparents uh, uh, came from. Uh, down to Moose Factory, along the bay, they, they paddled and sailed down to the James Bay. Then, uh, then uh, once they reached Moose Factory, they went up the river, Moose River, Abitibi River, all the way up to New Post or Tegwatagamo. So in 1905, that was their route. In 1906, they continued on their journey and, uh, and picked up from where they left off the year before. And they went to Abitibi, Matachuan, Matagami, Flying Post, New Brunswick House, Long Lake, Missinabi, Chaparral Creek. So those were the two years and those are the areas that they, that they covered in, in 1905 and, and 19, uh, 1906. Like I said before, Ontario was invited to be part of the process because Ontario was getting really, really, really worried. They were hearing about these treaties that were done in, in uh, let's say, Treaty 3 in 1870s and other treaties, Robinson, Huron. And they were getting really concerned that the federal government was, uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, interfering, uh, perhaps, in, in the allocation of lands and, and those kinds of things. And they wanted to be the, the part of any future treaty making. So for the first time in, in, uh, in, in any treaty, Ontario became part of the James Bay Treaty or Treaty Number no. 9. They formalized that by way of an agreement in 1894 that said, that, said, uh, uh, that said basically that any future treaties with the Indians in respect of territory in Ontario to which they have not before the passing of the said statutes surrendered their claim aforesaid shall be deemed to require the concurrence of the government of Ontario. So in, 19, in 1894, they made an agreement with Canada saying, we want to be part of that process. So Ontario is a big part of Treaty No. 9, uh, James Bay Treaty. So let's take a look at, the, from the government's end, <clears throat> what, what their intention was. What was the intention of the government? Why did they want to make a treaty with the, with the, with the Meshkego? Why did they want to make a treaty with the Crees? Why did they want to come up and, 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 uh, and, and, and make a treaty? Their, their intention was very, very simple. And that was, and that is to secure an extinguishment of the Indian title to lands. They wanted our lands. They wanted our lands uh, because they could see resource development happening in the future. They could see railroads happening in the future. They could see towns and villages cropping up into the future. And they could see wealth, they could see economy, they could see mining, they could see forestry happening in the future. But there are Indians up there though. There are Meshkego, there are Cree people up there. So let's go make a treaty. Let's get them to extinguish rights to their land. Let's take their land from them. But they didn't, but they didn't say that. They didn't say that in the treaty making process because you remember, they didn't translate the treaty document. They didn't uh, read it word for word. They said things to make it sound good so we would accept the treaty. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So their, their, in, their interest uh, was, was very, very simple. They wanted our land. That's why they, that's why they made the, the treaty. So in return of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of that, in, uh, their, in return of taking our land, uh, they, they said, we'll give you a reserve. We have a formula for, uh, there's a, for, uh, there's a, for one square mile for each family of five. For you, so for each family of five, there will be one square mile uh, given. So if there are 20, 25, 30, or 100 people there, you multiply that, and that's the size of the reserve that was giving, given uh, to, to the people. So the Moose Creek First Nation Reserve, or the Moose Reserve, uh, Moose Factory Reserve down in, <clears throat> in this community and up the river at French River. That's how it was allocated because of that formula. And they told our people, okay, this is the reserve, this is where you're going to live. So that's, that's, how, that's what we got in return. And what else did they, did they give us in, in, in exchange of, of, uh, of the treaty, of the uh, taking our land? Okay, they said, we'll give you annuities. In other words, we'll give you money. We'll give you treaty money. 
Uh, you see the treaty people coming here every summer to give out four dollar bills for everybody, to uh, for to give out four dollars uh, to everybody. But back in the day, in 1905, it was eight dollars per uh, for the first year. In 1905, it was eight dollars, and they said it'll be four dollars in perpetuity, or in other words, forever. We'll give you four dollars per person. Back in, if you're thinking back in 1905, think about it. Eight dollars, that's a lot of money. You, you could probably buy supplies for the whole year for you to be in the bush. You can buy your traps, you can buy your ammunition, you can buy your basic staples to be in a bush for eight dollars. So that was a lot of money. Even four dollars back in 1905, 1906 was a lot of money. And, uh, and it's remained that way uh, since. What else did they, did they give? Well, they gave a flag. They said, okay, here, chief. You can have this flag, and and the, and the other thing they said is we want peace and order. Behave yourselves, uh, uh, Greece. We we want peace and order here. We 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 want things to 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 people to live in live in uh, live in harmony. So those are the kinds of things that were given in exchange for securing an an extinguishment of the Indian title to land. So here we are in 2013. We look at that and we think about it. That wasn't a very good deal. So I'll talk a little bit later in my presentation uh, a little bit more about that and, and uh, how it is today and how we understand it today and what it means, what it means uh, today. <clears throat> that was the government. That was the government's uh, intention or, or, or why they wanted to make a treaty, to get our land. But what about us? What about us as Crees? What about us as Omashkego? What about us as Moose Cree people? What was our thinking? What, what did we believe to be the reason why the treaty was being made? We, we had good intentions. We had good thoughts. We welcomed the treaty people. We welcomed them, welcomed them into our territory. And, and, and we said, this is a good thing. This is a good thing what's going on here, this, this treaty. We should have a treaty. We didn't understand. They did not tell us that they want our land to take our land. They didn't tell us that. We only understood it to be a good thing. So we understood it to be a, a, a treaty of friendship, a treaty of, uh, that would bring happiness and prosperity, and that we would, uh, and that we would, be, uh, we, we would be looked after, that we would be taken care of, and that we'd have a partnership, and that we'd have a sharing, uh, a sharing uh, relationship with, uh, with the Crown and the Government of Canada. That's how we looked at it. We, 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 uh, we understood it to be a very, very good thing for us. Because the, uh, the government or the commissioners did not say why they were really doing that, to take our land. If they said, if they sat in front of my grandfather and, and said, look, Andrew Wesley, who is my grandfather and signatory to the treaty, if they told him, we're here to take your land, you can't use your land forever, you can't use it anymore, here, sign this treaty. Do you think my grandfather would agree? Do you think your grandfather would agree? Do you think our our grandparents and forefathers would have agreed to the treaty? No, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have. So our interpretation of why the treaty was being made was a lot different from what the um, what the crown and what the commissioners were saying. <clears throat> now, I, I was saying that Ontario uh, was a part of the uh, is a part of the treaty making uh, uh, process. They kind of undermine that today. In 2012, 2013, they're kind of diminishing their role. They're saying, well, the federal government really is the treaty maker. We're not really a part of that discussion. If we are, we're taking a risk. We really shouldn't be talking about the treaty. Uh, so there's all, all kinds of uh, apprehensions by the government of Ontario today in terms of their role in the treaty. But the, 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 the main part is, though, the the, uh, the real thing, though, is that they are part of the treaty. Uh, Ontario is a big part uh, of, of the treaty, and they should be uh, um, accountable and, and uh, uh, be part of any treaty discussion. Let's take uh, a look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, the desire of the government in terms of taking our land. Let's look at the wording in the treaty, the exact wording in the treaty that was not explained to us that was not explained to us. Let's take a look at the wording in the treaty that talks about taking our land. It's called the taken up clause. And as a matter of fact, if you have time, 
uh, Google the James Bay Treaty or Treaty Number no. Nine, and you'll see all of this in there. And the taken up clause states exactly this. And His Majesty the King hereby is, agrees with the said Indians that they shall have the right to pursue their usual vocations of hunting, trapping, fishing throughout the tract surrendered. So the wording in the treaty is, you can hunt, fish, and trap in your in the territory, in all that the area that you uh, the, that you surrendered as part of this treaty, you can still hunt, fish, and trap. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Then it goes on to say, as heretofore described, subject to such such regulations as may from time to time be made by the government of the country, acting under the authority of His Majesty and saving and accepting such tracts as may be required for taken or taken up from time to time for settling, mining, lumbering, trading, or other purposes. So in other words, the, the treaty says, the exact wording in the treaty says, you can continue to use your, you can continue use, uh, using the land as you always have. But if we, Ontario, or if we, Canada, want to use it for mining, settlement, lumbering, or any other purposes, we can take it, and you can't use your land no more. That's what the treaty says. But that was not explained to us when the treaty-making process was, uh, was, uh, was, being, uh, was being done. Like I said, if my grandfather had understood the taken-up clause and what's really being intended here, he would not have signed the treaty. Same with your grandparents, same with, the, same with our, our forefathers, or, uh, they would not have uh, agreed. But that's what it says in the treaty, which reinforces uh, Canada's intention back in the day to extinguish Indian title to lands. And it's right there in the, in, in the treaty. The commissioners were not allowed to change any part of the treaty document. Like I said, they came here, it was prepared well beforehand, and they were not allowed to change it. Even if we uh, uh, wanted certain things changed, they wouldn't. They wouldn't uh, change it. They were under strict orders from their bosses in Ottawa not to change anything in, in, the, in the treaty treaty document. Now that's, that's the first part of my presentation, how it came about, what happened, and what was the intention. But it starts to look good. It starts to look uh, promising. We, I call that the turning point. And that is, we go, we've gained new evidence. We gained a new understanding. We've gained uh, a better perspective of how the treaty really came about. And I'll be talking about that in, in, the, next, in the coming moments. Back in 19, uh, <clears throat> 1995, at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, uh, a, uh, a student was looking in the archives, archives of Queen's University, and they came across the diaries of the commissioners, especially the one of the Ontario Commissioner uh, Daniel George McMartin. All, all three commissioners, Jane, uh, <coughs> uh, Stuart, Campbell Scott, as well as McMartin, they all kept notes they all kept diaries. Um, <clears throat> Samuel Stewart and Duncan Campbell Scott, the federal commissioners, kept very, very short, short uh, notes in their in their diaries. They said something like, "We made treaty today, leaving tomorrow." Very, very simple and to the point. But Daniel George McBarton, the Ontario commissioner, gave kept really detailed notes of what was said by the commissioners, what we said on our side, and what was said in the treaty making process. And that's what's really, really exciting and interesting in terms of this commissioner's diaries. Because his diaries confirm what our elders have been saying all along, and that, we, that, and that is we did not give up our, our land. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, as we go along. And I'll give examples. For example, in Osnaburg, where they started the treaty making process, or Mishkigogama, in July 12, 1905, the, uh, the, the, the commissioners gave their, their, their verb in terms of what they're, what they're doing. And, the, and I have to, I have to uh, admit, and I'm realizing when I'm doing research in the, uh, in, the, in the treaty making process, that our people back in the day in 1905 were very, very shrewd 
they're very, very smart. They're very, very astute negotiators. And they could see and they asked questions. For example, in, in um, Mishkigogama, in Osnaburg, Misabe, who was blind, he was blind, he couldn't see, but he was a true leader. People looked up to him. He was well-spoken. He could still go out on the land with the help of his son. And he was very, very knowledgeable. And he was looked upon as a leader. And when he heard the words from the commissioners, he said, what's going on here? This is, this is too good to be true. Tell me. So I can continue using my lands forever? I can use it forever, no ifs, ands, or buts about it? And I said, yeah, for sure. He said, okay, I accept the treaty. Because he was concerned, he had questions about, about that. And they were assured that they were not to be expected to give up their hunting grounds and that they could hunt and fish throughout their territory. Informed that they could continue to live as they always did, they accepted the treaty. So the commissioners were very, very careful because they wanted the, 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 uh, our people to accept the treaty. They said good things for us to be able to accept it and to take the treaty and to approve it and to put our mark on it. They did not say, according to the taken up clause that I talked about before, they did not say, you can use your land, but if we want to use it for mining, forestry, or other things, you can't use it anymore, we're going to take it. They didn't say that, because they knew if they said that, they wouldn't get the approval of our people. So they said good things. They said, you can always use your land forever. And of course, our people were happy about that, and they accepted uh, the treaty. Same with Fort Hope. Again, Munias. Munias and Fort Hope, he was very, very suspicious. And he said, what? Uh, <coughs> is this true? Uh, how can we, uh, how can we uh, uh, get something for nothing? Usually if you give us something, we give something back. And after the commissioners assured Munias, a leader of the day, he accepted the treaty. Again, the taken up clause or the real reason why the government was here, was there, or did, never came up. And that's evidence through the diaries. This is the diaries of Daniel George McBarton uh, saying exactly what he heard and he wrote it down. And this is the evidence that's very, very exciting what we're using today. Same with the Noguki, same with Martin Falls. Uh, again, the commissioners were questioned. And, uh, and, uh, and they, as, as, uh, they were assured that they could hunt wherever they pleased, then they, they accepted the treaty. In Albany, in old Albany, again, Andrew Wesley being my grandfather who lived there, they was assured that he could hunt fish and trap forever, and he, he agreed. Nothing at all about the taking up clause and what the government really was trying to do. That was not talked about whatsoever. In New Post, in, uh, in uh, Moose Factory. They came down to Moose Factory along the bay. And Frederick Mark, he's got a lot of relatives even here to, today. Uh, Frederick Mark, who was there uh, listening, listening to the treaty discussions. And, and, uh, and he said, on the record, in the diaries, he said, he concurred in all that had been said. In all that had been said. So that's very, 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 very important. Not what he read in the treaty document, nothing of that. The words that came out of the treaty commissioner's uh, mouth, he understood them. They were good. We could hunt and use our land forever. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And, uh, and once he heard those words, he concurred and he said, okay, let's make a treaty. That's what we want to do. Same with a new post, Teco Tagamo. When they got over there, Angus Winisk, and Angus Winisk, a leader again of the day. He replied, I accept the terms as stated. So again, signifying the fact that the, the commissioners said things that were good and pleasing to our people and they accepted the terms of the treaty based on the fact that they were given assurances that they could hunt, fish and trap forever. They were not told what the treaty's intention really is and that is the taken applause that they would take, take our land, that we could hunt fish and trap, but if the government needed it, they would take it and use it, and we couldn't do those things anymore. They were not told that. 
and they were given assurances they could use our lands forever, and that's very, very, very critical, very, very important, and that's why we're excited about this evidence. That's why we're excited about the diaries. That's why we're excited about uh, about uh, the work that we're doing in terms of the treaty and make and uh, and uh, and telling the story, so that uh, so that we. Uh, uh, we we know that the treaty is very very significant in terms of uh, 